La Land. Theatrical triumphs aside, the new amalgamated school was not an easy place to be. An unpleasant competitiveness had emerged in the staff room. Cliques hardened and hostilities developed. Career teachers built their empires, sharpened up their CVs and prepared to move on to higher things. That usually meant a job in the advisory service or an easier post in the leafy suburbs. It did not mean teaching difficult children in a difficult area. That sense of everyone being in the same boat with the same sense of purpose had gone. Fancy phrases were used in the prospectuses, such as hypothetico-deductive reasoning, that were never understood by the parents, the children, or even the person who wrote them. The aim was clearly to impress the author's future employers, rather than the parents. Worse still, the sixth form was being phased out. That meant no more A-level teaching, and without sixth form was putting on a play like Jane's career would be impossible. When I had arrived at Dalston Mount School, I had wanted to get students through the A-level examination. That was the challenge. At Camden School it had been relatively easy. At Dalston Mount it was very hard indeed, but we had achieved some success. Now, without a sixth form, it was going to be a question of grinding through to the O-level standard. That prospect left me cold. It happened, because of the amalgamation, that Kingsland School was overstaffed and I was offered the chance to be a permanent supply teacher. I took it. I was drafted to a Catholic school in the east of the borough for six years. During that time I met and married a Californian and in 1989 I found myself living in Los Angeles. I had to earn a living, so instead of being a supply teacher, I became a substitute teacher. First, I had to get permission to work at all, and that ain't easy in the USA. You have to pay a lot of people a lot of money for a few pieces of paper. A lawyer had to be paid to facilitate the whole process. A notary public had to be paid to prove that I was who I said I was. Photographs and fingerprints had to be taken and the takers had to be paid. A doctor had to be paid to prove that I did not have AIDS and the government had to be paid for a piece of plastic with the words resident alien written on it. Now I could work. But then no one believed I had a degree or any teaching qualifications. No one seemed to have heard of London University or the Inner London Education Authority. In fact, not many people seemed to have heard of London. So I had to pay an equivalencer to equivalence my degrees. His job was to equate the hours spent on my degree courses to credits that I might have achieved in an American university. Finally, I had to pay to take an examination called the C-Best. In California, this is a test designed for prospective teachers at about GCSE O-level standard. The aim was to weed out illiterates and prevent them teaching, even though they might already have a university degree. Luckily, I passed, and so eventually I was allowed to start work. By this time, I had paid out $1,000 and had not worked for nearly three months. One law of supply teaching is that you tend to end up in schools that need you the most, in other words, the worst schools in the city. Los Angeles is split into many different school districts, each with its own pay scale for teachers. The poorest districts pay the least, but need the teachers the most. So I wasn't going to end up in Beverly Hills, folks. No. I was bound for Inglewood, an area from which African Americans were leaving and to which Hispanics were moving. Hispanics in Los Angeles formed the lowest class in the city. The lowest paid manual workers and domestic workers, otherwise known as servants, are usually Hispanics. The word is used to describe those people whose mother tongue is Spanish. In theory, 
this would include the Spanish royal family. However, they have been wise enough to avoid Los Angeles, at least since California became part of the Union in 1850. Inglewood was a rough district, dominated by guns, drugs and the gangs who controlled their use. It bordered on South Central, Watts, Hawthorne and Compton. Collectively, these areas are known as the Ghetto. From Hackney to Inglewood, somehow I had managed to jump from the frying pan straight into the fire. I started work at Inglewood High School. It was horrible. It was run by a principal who thought he was running a boot camp for juvenile offenders. He had the boys driven into class by armed guards, collectively known as security. Even the staff was subjected to bouts of public humiliation and abuse from this ferociously angry man. The physical conditions were equally miserable. The classrooms resembled barracks, devoid of any signs of creativity, comfort or joy. The staff room was dark, gloomy and dominated by a huge glowing red monolith with the words Drink Pepsi shining from it. The day arrived for the school to come out and support the basketball team, normally an occasion which Americans usually enjoy, with its opportunities to show off, yell and display extremes of tribal and patriotic fervour. However, the staff and students of Inglewood High could barely raise a cheer for the school team, leaving the principal roaring and fulminating at his reluctant subjects. I realised that if I was detained for much longer at this detention centre, I would become as depressed and aggressive as everyone else. By good fortune, the neighbouring school, Morningside, needed a history teacher for a few months to cover an absence due to pregnancy. By comparison to Inglewood High, it was a holiday camp. In fact, the site at Morningside had originally been built as a sports club and had somehow retained the ambiance of a place designed for the pursuit of leisure. Also, it was clear that someone at the school had had the idea that children are best encouraged to fulfil their potential in a friendly atmosphere rather than one of misery and aggression. Instead of a policy of bullying confrontation, I found one of gentle coercion. Consequently, the students were pleasant and reasonably cooperative. Nevertheless, it was still a ghetto school. There was an armed, uniformed policeman constantly patrolling the ground in a police car, and if the students were troublesome in class, the teachers could reach for a telephone on the wall and say the word, Security. Seconds later, a posse of fully armed men in uniform would storm into the room and drag out the miscreants. There were other indications that I was still in a difficult area. Gunshots could be heard all around us on a regular basis. At registration, boys would often come to me and apologise for missing school because they had had to attend the funeral of a friend who had been shot or because they had been recovering from a knife or gun wound. The boys identified with the Bloods, one of the principal African-American street gangs of the area. Gang colours were not allowed to be worn in school, so to show their loyalty to the Bloods, whose colour was red, they allowed their jeans to slip to mid-buttock, revealing bright red underpants. Subsequently, the style became fashionable on both sides of the Atlantic. Hispanics had their gangs too. I began noticing the Roman numerals XV111 on walls around the school. Upon inquiry, I discovered from a Latino student that this was the sign for the 18th Street Gang. Perhaps this might be an interesting way of introducing Latin into the curriculum? Then again, perhaps not. The principal rivals to the Bloods were the Crips who wore blue. It so happened that I had been given a blue golfing jacket by a kindly relative, which I frequently wore at school. Yo, Mr Baldwin, explained one of my students, that's a crib jacket you're wearing, man, and this is a blood school. It is, 
I nervously replied. Yeah, but don't you worry, Mr. Baldwin. Ain't nobody gonna mistake you for no crip. For the most part, the students were friendly and relaxed, in spite of the difficulties they faced. They were naturally inquisitive and thoughtful, but unlike my Jamaican students had no knowledge of London, Britain, or even Europe. I asked a group of 16-year-olds to point on the classroom atlas to where they thought England might be found. Not one located it, and most pointed at Africa. They did seem to know, at least, that it was somewhere east of California. Geography and social studies do not have a place in the California curriculum. Very few of my students would have possessed a passport. At that time, only 7% of Americans did. So they assumed that I was an Australian, like Crocodile Dundee, and cheerfully greeted me every morning with, G'day, mate! This was 1989 post Beatles and pre-Spice Girls. Once we got past the introductions, my job was to teach classes of 16 to 18 year olds the history of the USA. In practice, I was not expected to teach them anything. In effect, I simply had to distribute, collect and mark worksheets and tests. These had been produced by the State Education Authority and were designed to be used in conjunction with the history textbook. All the students had to do was to find the right words in the textbook and put them in the appropriate gap in the sentences on the worksheet. At the end of the week, a chapter was supposed to have been completed and the students then sat a multiple choice test based on the worksheets they had filled in. This system of teaching history had been in use throughout California for the last 30 years. After one lesson, I became bored of this and decided to teach the students in the way that I would have taught similar students in London. In introducing the American Civil War, I discussed the differing points of view, explained that there were books in the library that they could consult and asked them to write an essay on the causes of the war and bring it to me in a week. Jaws dropped. Mouths hung open. I explained that an essay is a piece of writing in which you argue a case in answer to a question. It is made up of paragraphs, I continued. Oh, what's a paragraph, Mr. Baldwin? They asked. It then dawned on me that these students, some of whom were hoping to go to a university, had never been asked to write a paragraph, let alone an essay. They had only been asked to fill in gaps on worksheets and tiny circles on multiple choice tests. I thought I would start the essay writing process with just a few of the more successful students. I approached a young man whose records suggested that he had been doing quite well at his work. He was a B-grade student. I began by congratulating him on his progress. OK, he said. You're doing very well, Pablo. He looked a little nervous. I'm just congratulating you on your work, I continued. Que? Can't speak no English, came the explanation from a boy who sat nearby. Later, I discovered that Pablo, an intelligent, resourceful and hard-working youth, had discovered a method of completing the worksheets by observing the length of the spaces and finding a word of the appropriate length from the textbook. He would learn off his corrected sheet by heart and thus be able to get a reasonable mark on his weekly test. All this without understanding one word of the language he was using. Now I knew just how far we had to go. I decided to teach my classes in my own way. I explained about causes and effects, differing points of view and using the evidence to argue a case. I tried to make them work out why things happened in history. I got them to write paragraphs and, eventually, essays. They all went on to produce a research paper on the history of an African country of their choice. I believe they appreciated it. Not so the teacher whose class I was covering. When she returned, after her pregnancy leave, I was four chapters in the textbook behind where the state decreed that I should have been, and she was cross. She did not care about analysis, research and the writing of essays. 
When I tried to explain what I'd been trying to do, it was as if I was talking in a different language. By week 33, you should be on chapter 33, she explained. Otherwise, your ass is on the line. Teachers in the USA are very anxious not to put their asses on the line, or indeed step out of it. It is a surprisingly authoritarian society, and it can be unwise not to do things by the book. I therefore apologised to the teacher whose classes I had been taking. I also recognised that if I were to keep earning a living as a teacher in Los Angeles, I would do well to keep my British concepts and ideas about teaching to myself until my return to Britain. One factor that keeps US teachers in line is a fear of being sued by indignant parents. A maths teacher told me how a parent had objected to the grade he had given a certain pupil. The boy's mother happened to be on the school board and proceeded to get him sacked. He took his case to court and was vindicated. However, the bitterness and hostility shown towards him both in the school and the local community was such that he was forced to leave the area altogether. This story helped me understand why multiple choice tests were so popular with the teachers. First, a machine could add up the correct answers for you, and secondly, no parent could argue with the mark, any form of subjective marking which you have to have in the assessing of essays, can be queried easily and subsequently the teacher may find themselves defending their opinion in court. Opinions about the quality of a student's work are not the only ones that are subject to litigation. I was once talking to a class about early man. We were discussing the findings of Dr. Leakey in Olduvai Gorge in Kenya, when seven of the pupils rose and without saying a word left the room. One of the remaining students explained that those who had left were fundamentalist Christians. On arrival back in the staff room, I explained what had happened to one of my colleagues. Well, I hope the parents don't find out, he said, because if they do, you won't be working in this district anymore. Surely I can show that I was just discussing established, scientifically proven fact. Better get yourself a good lawyer. That's all I can say. Fortunately, the children did not seem to want to take the matter further. For my part, I was only too happy to overlook the insubordination that they had expressed by walking out of my class. In any case, I had moved on from early man and wouldn't be returning to his murky past. I was beginning to get nervous of pupil power. It seemed that if a teacher put as much as a foot out of line, students, backed by their parents, would be down on them like a ton of bricks. I once omitted a single instruction in a lesson I was covering for an English teacher. It was an inconsequential error, and I had carried out everything else she had asked of me with reasonable efficiency. The next day, she confronted me. The students gave you a bad rap yesterday, she said. She then explained what I had done wrong. Yet, it was the students who had been my judges and who had pronounced me guilty. She had merely accepted their judgment. Another example of pupil power was on the way, but this time I could relax because it wasn't my butt they were about to kick. A number of students had decided that the campus was a bit messy and went on strike. They demonstrated. Soon, half the school was marching up and down with placards outside the front entrance. The local press smelt a story. Members of the school board, aspiring politicians and preachers, began to appear. Some made speeches on behalf of the students, berating the conditions in which they had to work. Metaphors were found, slavery was mentioned, and soon the student protest was being hailed as a further step in the long march to freedom. There was talk of sacking the principal. But he was a man who understood only too well the power of the media. Before coming to Morningside, he had turned around a sink school in Washington to such an effect that Hollywood had made a movie about his triumphs. This was not just a principal, but a super principal. He offered to meet the students in the manner of Richard II meeting the revolting peasants. 
In his address to the crowd, he extolled the virtues of cleanliness and godliness. He praised their courage in bringing the matter to light. He took complete responsibility for the state of the toilets. He suggested that the students had as much as saved him from hell and damnation by their noble action in bringing this deficiency to his notice. He concluded by stating, with something of an emotional tremor in his voice, I will personally come in over the weekend and clean those restrooms myself, and by Monday morning, God damn it, they will be clean. He slammed his fist on the table to emphasize the point. This was heroic stuff. But, I thought to myself, surely the school must have cleaners. Now, I want you to go back to your classrooms and continue your studies safe in the knowledge that the work of sanitizing your restrooms will begin from the moment you leave this room. He began to roll up his sleeves. Any questions? Uh, Principal, I inquired. Surely it's not right for a principal to be cleaning toilets at the weekend. I mean, aren't there any cleaners who can do it? The principal looked at me for a second with an expression of bafflement and annoyance. Then he laughed, a big, loud laugh. I'm sure you do things different in England. But, hey, we got a problem here and I got to fix it. Now, you kids... Get back to your classes and leave this one to me. And so they did. The strike was over. The toilets were cleaned, although I never discovered who actually did the job, and the super principal carried on being a super principal. <laughs> teaching history was completed, I stayed on for the rest of the year, covering the absence of a technical drawing teacher. This time, I was given no programme to administer and no book to plough through. In fact, there were no resources in the classroom at all, except a few bits of coloured paper and a set of scissors. I still had to set work, mark it and give the students grades. So I found a load of old magazines and we went into anniversary card production, cutting up the magazines and forming collages according to the theme of the card. Thus, I was able to give my students grades and they all had nice birthday cards to give to their families on special occasions. They were very anxious about their grades because their school diploma could only be obtained if their grade point averages were high enough. If they weren't, they might have to come back in the summer to do the extra work required to graduate. I gave them A's for making nice cards and B's for turning up and not giving me a hard time. In general, we got along nicely. The only difficulty I had was when I observed that a boy was showing a pistol to his friends. Put it away, I said, as if I'd caught him reading the Beano, Put it away now and make sure it never reappears in this classroom again or I will be obliged to confiscate it. To my amazement, the boy apologised and the gun vanished. As it never re-emerged, our relationship was soon restored and I was able to give the gentleman an A for his excellent anniversary cards. Some of the more astute students were by now realising, as I was, that a school diploma based on these grades was a fairly meaningless certificate. At the end of the day, it showed that the recipient had attended school regularly and had carried out the required tasks, none of which required very much thought or even knowledge of the English language. It was equally clear that the colleges and universities were not going to take very much notice of such a diploma either. They had already introduced a standard aptitude test to see if any of the students coming out of school, such as Morningside, had any real potential. It was essentially an intelligence test. I have no doubt that this test may have enabled some of those students to get a college place, 
but the very existence of such a test suggested that the 12 years of schooling that a student had just undergone was almost pointless. Unless you knew that you might be rescued, as it were, by the SAT, there was not very much point in working at all. Conversely, if you knew that you would not be rescued by the test, there was still no point in working. This did not, of course, apply to those with sporting talent. The television companies for the televising of college sports pay huge fees to the universities. This money subsidises all other aspects of university life. It is reckoned that without it, many of the universities would go bankrupt. Consequently, it matters a great deal that the athletes are of a very high quality and win their games. The search for such athletes is intense and scholarships are readily available for anyone with athletic potential. Morningside made a huge fuss of its athletes. They knew perfectly well that this was the only real chance they had of getting anyone into college. When big matches took place, the school stopped work and the band was made to play. The dancing girls danced, everyone chanted and stamped their feet, all as if their lives depended on it. In a sense, they did. A colleague told me that when an athlete with college prospects had grades that were lower than the required minimum, which was pretty low, the school administration, in their desperation to register some success, would find a way to help him over that particular academic hurdle. Whether this was true or not, I do not know. However, it was clear that sports scholarships would probably be the only route to a respectable university for a student from Morningside. For those who were not potentially athletic or bright, there was not really much incentive to work. I began to notice that absenteeism was becoming rife, Dropping out was taking place on a large scale. Some of the boys were drifting towards the gangs as a more reliable support system. Some of the girls became pregnant. Often the fathers were athletes or gang members. These were, after all, young men with prospects. The risks involved in being a drug pusher in a gang were great, but if you could earn three to $4,000 a week for a while, it must have seemed like a risk worth taking. You work for me, the gang leader might say, and you'll be worth some. All the school could offer was a school diploma that was essentially worth less. So, Finally, and inevitably, we came to graduation day. Only about 25% of the original intake remained to receive their diplomas. Nevertheless, it was an occasion for pomp and ceremony, speeches, flash bulbs, and handshakes. As I watched the proceedings, I became aware that a Hispanic student on my left was grimacing with annoyance. I asked him what was the matter. Look, he said angrily. This is nothing to do with me or people like me. It's for them. There, up on stage, sat the assembled worthies, all African American. To their right was a gospel choir composed solely of African Americans. Standing on the podium was the guest speaker, Ben Vereen, famous for his role as Chicken George in Roots, delivering a speech about the march to freedom from slavery. There was no Hispanic representation anywhere to be seen. The programme had been designed by African Americans for African Americans, even though half the student population and graduates were of Hispanic origin. I was observing American racial politics in action. It was sad to see, even though I realised that most of those respectable figures on stage had themselves been the recipients of slights and indignities from the whites at this school in the past. A mere 20 years before, Morningside had been an all-white school. I could tell this from the school photographs. Then African Americans had moved in. Ten years later, there were hardly any white students left, and it was 95% African American. By the time I arrived in 1990, 
over 50% of the school population was Hispanic. A few years later, I was informed by a colleague who had remained that the figure had risen to 90%. Estate agents were, of course, the only real beneficiaries of this level of ethnic migration. I do not think that anyone else got much out of it. In school, the different groups remained ghettoized just as they were in the world outside. In class, the two groups sat apart and there were few interracial friendships. The Hispanics were barely recognised as a separate cultural and linguistic group. There was only one Hispanic teacher and his job was to deal with the difficult Hispanic children and liaise with their parents. When a free Spanish language course was offered to the teachers, only three of us showed up and I was one of them. Once a year on Cinco de Mayo, Hispanic culture and traditions were recognised for a day. African Americans, by dint of hard work, had got Black History Month, and white America claimed the remaining 11. America was no melting pot, I reflected, just a patchwork quilt dominated by white squares. I was beginning to look forward to returning to Hackney, where I felt I would once again be in a real melting pot. Cheers.